ask questioners, our next speaker, and through his questions, giving you a pretty good idea what he's going to talk about. It's Ray Hawk from the University of Hawaii, an astronomer who spends a lot of time looking through the moon with spectrograph, looking at the moon through telescopes with spectrographs, and figure out what's there. It turns out you can find out a lot more than we know, and he just found some very interesting deposits, what are called pyroclastic deposits, which simply means volcanic ash, more or less. I'm sure you'll tell you why what I said is wrong. <laughs> and uh, he's going to talk about their potential use as resources and then how you can characterize things in general. And this will hopefully lead into a talk by Rob Staley about how you would look for and perhaps characterize asteroids. And then Jim Burke will give a little more perspective on ways that you would characterize these things from spacecraft. And then we'll break for open discussion at about 5.30. I'll be talking this afternoon about remote sensing of uh, all the lunar surface. And uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, sort of briefly review with you the various uh, uh, types of uh, remote sensing techniques, the ways that we have of uh, finding out uh, what's uh, uh, the types of material that's on the lunar surface. And then I'll show uh, a couple of examples of the way that we first use remote sensing techniques to answer science questions about the moon. And finally, to uh, I'll search for economic deposits on the surface of the moon. So uh, that's where I intend to um, uh, go. Uh, gee, I wish I could be that fellow right there and uh, be on the surface of the moon. But unfortunately, the moon is not available these days for field studies by humans, and so we're forced to uh, uh, use remote sensing techniques uh, from uh, either uh, for Earth from Earth or uh, from uh, uh, using the remote sensing data that was uh, uh, returned by the Apollo missions. Uh, there were numerous remote sensing uh, experiments uh, contained on the Apollo spacecraft in the command module, and uh, some of those are still very usable today. Not all of the information has been fully uh, extracted from those data sets. And the, um, uh, as an example, this, this is a, um, uh, a color image of the surface of the moon with the Mari area is outlined in white and has an overprint of the aluminum magnesium ratio uh, for a limited portion of the uh, lunar surface. The um, uh, uh, Apollo Command Module on Apollo 15 and 16 uh, carry an, uh, an X ray uh, 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 instrument, uh, spectrograph, and uh, uh, spectrometer, X ray spectrometer, and was able to detect. Uh, uh, um, solar x-rays would excite the uh, elements in the surface, and these could be detected, and hence so uh, uh, produce these maps. Uh, basically, the uh, uh, red areas are areas that are, uh, have very uh, uh, high magnesium to aluminum ratios, very low amounts of aluminum, very high amounts of magnesium, and the uh, sort of pinkish areas are the ones that are really high in, uh, uh, in aluminum versus magnesium. This generally correlates with the uh, uh, whether you're in the highlands of the moon or out on the water uh, surface. Uh, so let, uh, the x-ray data will give you uh, uh, aluminum and magnesium information. Unfortunately, there's only, a, as you can see, only a small percentage of the lunar surface covered with this, uh, with this particular data. Uh, only about, gee, like, uh, a few percent, uh, about eight or nine percent, depending on how you, where you draw the cutoff. Uh, Another data set was the, uh, uh, the gamma ray spectrometer, and uh, with the uh, gamma ray spectrometer, we were able to determine uh, thorium, uh, potassium, iron, and titanium, and also uh, magnesium to a certain extent. This is just a, a small um, uh, area of the lunar surface that uh, has a titanium uh, map with uh, high abundances of uh, uh, titanium. We have shown in yellow, and the lower abundances in uh, uh, green and uh, uh, blue. Now, these, uh, this is a fairly, uh, it covers a much more extensive area of the moon, but we didn't have to depend on where the sun was striking to excite the, uh, the x-rays. Uh, and we could pick up uh, these uh, uh, gamma rays from uh, um, roughly twice the area for, uh, that we got the uh, x-ray data for. Uh, and again, these uh, data sets are, are still uh, useful today, and we're still using them to extract, uh, um, uh, to go back to extract uh, useful information uh, from the data. Uh, there were other data, remote sensing data from Apollo that has either been mined out or was never worth a darn to start with. Um, the, uh, there was a, a UV experiment that was supposed to detect the lunar atmosphere. Of course, since there is no lunar atmosphere, it detected nothing. Um, 
That was some thermal experiments, uh, some lunar sounder data. It was a, a radar experiment on Apollo 17 that uh, all produced some very uh, uh, interesting results about the uh, internal structure of the upper couple of kilometers of the moon. However, NASA cut off the funding for the analysis of the data, and uh, so that's still set in some archives someplace. But uh, uh, hopefully there are plans to start uh, reanalyzing some of that uh, lunar sounder data. It could be very interesting. Um, so uh, anyhow, that's the uh, uh, sort of information that we have from the uh, uh, Apollo, and it was 20 years later, it's still good uh, data. The other, um, uh, uh, most of the, if we want to get new data today, what we have to do is use the Earth-based techniques, and uh, there are uh, all, uh, two primary uh, uh, Earth-based remote sensing techniques that, uh, uh, that we utilize quite commonly. Uh, the first is uh, radar uh, data. People have been uh, uh, bouncing radar uh, beams off the moon for a, a long time, picking up the returns. Um, and uh, this is a, 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 got to be quite a high art, and the, uh, it's being uh, uh, perfected. Uh, the uh, radar scientists, Tommy Thompson, Stan Zisk, are two of the most prominent. Um, use a, a 70 centimeter or 3.8 centimeter radar data. Now, what good does that tell you? It tells you the moon's there. I mean, why do you want to bounce radar waves off the moon? Well, it tells you things about the surface roughness of the moon, and it does give you some compositional information. Also, uh, 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 radar studies can be very useful, essentially blocky areas uh, that are blocky on the, uh, on the order of the wavelength of the uh, radar being used, uh, a very high uh, 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 echo, and the um, uh, uh, areas with a deep regolith with very low block density or uh, show is very smooth. These are just happen to be some uh, uh, older uh, uh, 70 centimeter radar uh, images, polarized and depolarized, from the, uh, uh, the Apennine uh, mountain region. In fact, it was those data that were used for every planning Apollo 15 mission so many years ago. Um, we're really progressing in our ability to uh, obtain high resolution radar for the moon. Uh, this data I'm showing here is really low resolution. Uh, even the best of uh, uh, the old radar data sets have a spatial resolution of one to two kilometers. Uh, now, the data that I'm currently working with, which stands this as, a, as obtained, has a 30 meter resolution as opposed to a two kilometer resolution. And Stan is talking in terms of centimeters, centimeters of resolution for the study of the lunar surface for Earth-based radar, and that's pretty fabulous. Um, moving uh, on to uh, uh, the data that uh, uh, I'm uh, most familiar with, that I spend most of my time working with, is spectral reflectance data. Uh, spectral reflectance, uh, all that uh, uh, that is, for those that aren't uh, initiated into the mysteries of reflection spectroscopy, is you measure the different, uh, uh, essentially the different colors of um, uh, uh, light that's reflected back from the moon. And different uh, minerals reflect uh, uh, light in different ways and reveal themselves by these characteristic ratios um, that, uh, of the material. Now, you see uh, uh, in the uh, uh, slide here, these are uh, a spectra of um, uh, various minerals and rocks. There's an Apollo 12 Mari basalt from the moon, uh, the mineral ilmenite, mineral pyroxene, and mineral plagioclase. And, uh, uh, you can see dips, uh, absorption bands, absorption features in those uh, various minerals. You can see, especially around one micron, there's very characteristic absorption for uh, the mineral pyroxene. And one can see that the, the basalt sample seems to have an absorption band about that point, and it is uh, the dominant mineral in the basalt is, uh, of course, pyroxene. It's a little tiny amount of ilmenite and some plagioclase, but uh, it is through analysis of these reflection spectra based on uh, again, uh, having looked at the rocks and the minerals in the laboratory, knowing what the, where these bands are located, and then applying this to the uh, uh, telescopic spectra. That, um, <clears throat> that's how we derive the uh, 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 mineral chemistry for the various uh, 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 mineral phases present as well as the abundances and the lithology to know what kind of rock it is at any different spa uh, place on the moon. Uh, these are telescopic spectra for, uh, uh, for the moon. They're really hard to tell uh, uh, a lot about in this uh, 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 format. These uh, spectra happen to go from uh, 0.6 microns to about 2.5 microns. Generally, we uh, 
operate from about 0.3 to about 2.5. Uh, we use a technique on this called the uh, continuum removal uh, technique, where we fit a straight line continuum uh, and that uh, uh, to the, uh, 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 the spectrum, and then uh, 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 that allows us to uh, uh, see the absorption band uh, much better. And we can measure the lowest point on the band, see how deep it is, how wide it is, uh, how many of them there are. And again, from that information, I'll, I'll figure out the, uh, about the, uh, all the minerals, mineral chemistry, and the rock type. This particular spectrum has an interesting history. That it's the bowl of a crater called Nagarov F, which has always been one of my favorites. It sounds like a character and some creature in a Lovecraft novel. Um, so here's what this is Nagarov. Uh, <coughs> That's not and uh, all that uh, particular spectrum reveals something very important to us. Uh, we can tell that uh, uh, from uh, analysis of that reflection spectrum that uh, the material exposed in the bowl of that crater is Mari basalt. That it has a characteristic composition of, uh, uh, of the Mari material. However, uh, that area for the most part is kind of light, light colored, uh, like the uh, uh, the river highlands. Nagaroth itself, as you can see, is a dark halo crater. It has a dark halo around it. What has happened there is Nagaroth dug down beneath a light-covered surface layer and excavated a very ancient Mare basalt deposit that was emplaced uh, very early in lunar history. And it was, in fact, Nagaroth and some of its buddies in this area that revolutionized our thinking about the onset of volcanism on the surface of the moon. We now know that it happened very early on and in some areas like this, it's buried up and has only been exposed in a few places like Nagaroth. Now, uh, there are other um, uh, the, uh, uh, types of spectral techniques that uh, we, can, we can use. The, um, uh, the reflection spectra, like for Nagaroth and that one that I showed previously, are what we call spot spectra, where we put an aperture or a hole uh, on the, uh, from our, our instrument on the surface of the moon and collect spectra for an area of about uh, one and a half kilometers at best. Uh, we can also uh, uh, do a, a, a spectral imaging where we uh, essentially look at one color of light from the uh, surface of the moon uh, and maybe ratio a couple of images obtained that way. This is a very early attempt at um, uh, making a multispectral image. It's the color difference photograph produced by Ewen Whitaker. And you'll note that uh, all, some of the, uh, the units look pretty different uh, than on the, uh, uh, the full moon, uh, the normal uh, albedo uh, uh, image of the moon. Uh, and so this tells us a, uh, a lot. Since we're, in this particular case, we're essentially looking at the visible and the ultraviolet. And we can uh, uh, distinguish various units and tell something about their uh, composition from these spectral images. A more sophisticated version of uh, multispectral imaging has been done by, well, uh, uh, this is the image from uh, uh, Torrance Johnson's work, uh, and where he's uh, combined uh, uh, several different uh, images and made a mosaic of uh, uh, a portion of the lunar surface, which reveals the extent and something about the composition of uh, various uh, uh, Mare basalt units in this area. Uh, how do we uh, uh, use this? Spectral information, multispectral images. Here's one thing that's come out of it. This is a, 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 a map of the Mare basalt type distribution on the lunar front side. This was produced by uh, Carly Peters uh, some years ago. And um, uh, as you can see, there's a, a considerable variety of uh, different composition. It's all, all of the Mare basalts, the volcanic rock, are not the same in composition, but there are three different types. And the next slide shows. Uh, the ones in, in red and orange are ones that we've not sampled. Only the yellow units have been sampled by the Apollo missions or by the Luna uh, sample return mission, missions the Soviets sent. So there are many types of basalt on the lunar surface that we don't have in our labs, yet using Earth-based spectral techniques, we can tell what they're made of. Uh, here's another way that uh, we uh, use our remote sensing data. This is uh, an example of uh, uh, Mari basalt flow in Mari embryo. And we could, uh, you can see on the photograph that uh, it's, uh, uh, these are distinct flows of material. We can see the tongues of uh, uh, material uh, uh, and the flow lobes. 
And uh, we noticed that it was distinct in the multispectral images. Dibbert that's fairly young in age. Uh, now, young on the moon means it's two and a half billion years old, but still the other results are three billion. So uh, this is a, a, a relatively young unit. It's distinct in color, moderate titanium. And when we looked at it with the, um, all, uh, the um, gamma ray data, we found out that this particular Mars basalt flow has an unusual abundance of radioactive elements that the uh, uh, amount of thorium, uh, potassium, uranium is uh, relatively high in that particular basalt flow. Oh, another way that we uh, <coughs> uh, use remote sensing data is to uh, study the composition of the lunar crust as a, a function of uh, depth and position on the moon. Uh, as you can see, the lunar surface is punched full of holes and basins, and these craters dug down into the uh, uh, crust of the moon and exposed material from different depths. And then if we're clever enough to use our, uh, our spectral techniques, our multispectral images, to examine the material that was thrown out of the moon uh, from various depths, then we can uh, uh, understand what the whole crust is like without actually having gone there and sampled. This next uh, image just shows uh, an example of what happens during a cratering event where you impact into a layered target to <coughs> excavate and deposit the material on the exterior of the crater in somewhat systematic fashion. So you have some control, some idea of where it can come from at that. This is um, all perhaps one of the larger and certainly one of the best preserved examples of a large impact on the moon. This is a more tall basin. Uh, it has four major rings, about 900 kil uh, kilometers in diameter. And that has done a pretty good job of uh, digging down into the uh, uh, lunar crust. These are reflection spectra from uh, uh, ornitholic, various units in the ornitholic basin. We were able to determine that the uh, uh, bottom four are all composed of essentially a, a, a rock called a, a North Acidic Norlite, or nor uh, <coughs> which is basically a pyroxene plagioclase mixture. However, the top two spectra don't show that little dip about one micron. There's no pyroxene in there. Those things are composed of pure plagioclase. And this isn't exactly what we one might expect on the interior of a Warrantale Basin. This thing must have dug down uh, 60 or 70 kilometers into the lunar crust. And a layer of pure anorthosite at that depth is um, all, all not what we would have, all have expected. All. These are the areas. These are the areas where the uh, spectra were collected in this uh, particular area here. The north side spectra were found for the innermost ring of Warrantal. I'll show another view on the next uh, uh, slide of uh, exactly where that north side occurred. There's a Warrantal in the half shell, so the innermost ring exposed this material. So this is uh, just an example of the kinds of things that we can use the data for and. Uh, 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 some have proposed that an orthocyte might be a good resource for uh, uh, lunar uh, uh, mining operations. Uh, if so, uh, we have the capability of uh, uh, locating uh, uh, orthocyte deposits, and there are uh, several uh, of these deposits on the uh, front side of the moon. Um, another way that we use uh, remote sensing data to um, uh, uh, is to, uh, is to search for um, uh, deposits of possible economic importance, resources, actually to sort of do remotely what the uh, donkey and miner were doing in the previous speaker's talk. Uh, during the, immediately during the post-Apollo era, uh, there was talk of titanium production on the moon, or using regolith for shielding for um, uh, space stations, or uh, perhaps later for space-based defense system. And very recently, talk has shifted to oxygen production as propellant, or uh, helium-3 as a uh, fission fuel. Uh, ilmenite is, uh, some people think that uh, uh, the mineral ilmenite is the, uh, what we should be searching for on the moon in order to use as a feedstock for oxygen production. Now, the subject is controversial, and everyone has their pet method of extracting oxygen, some of them electrolysis of molten rock, and other things. But uh, uh, some people like the helium with uh, hydrogen reduction of uh, ilmenite. Ilmenite is an iron titanium oxide, and if you put in enough energy, uh, you can uh, extract uh, uh, oxygen, uh, iron for construction, and uh, you can get titanium out if you put in enough uh, uh, energy. 
Helium-3 is, uh, of course, uh, all, uh, it was planted in the lunar soil or lunar regolith by the um, uh, solar wind. Uh, its abundance has been found very in the regolith. And ilmenite rich, mature regolith uh, would be, has been determined to be the best source of uh, helium-3. Uh, if you go to the trouble of getting helium-3 out of the lunar soil, you also get some added uh, uh, benefits. You get uh, uh, the other solar wind gases out also, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, and uh, uh, these would be very useful, of course, in uh, lunar-based development and expansion. The common theme here for both oxygen and helium-3 is uh, um, uh, mineral ilmenite, and um, also some um, uh, workers have um, uh, started looking for the volcanic rocks on the moon that are rich in the mineral ilmenite. This is a map of the selected portion of the Mare basalts on the near side with the darkest blue uh, material, uh, the uh, being Mare flows that have a, a, a high abundance of uh, ilmenite. Uh, I've taken another approach and uh, have proposed that. All uh, these things might be uh, all, all excellent uh, for uh, a variety of purposes. These are the black spheres and orange glass returned from the Apollo 17 landing site by Jack Smith. They're about 40 microns in, in diameter. They're chemically equivalent. The black spheres have, are black because they have ilmenite grains in them, uh, quench crystallized ilmenite. The uh, orange glass is, uh, again, the same chemical composition, but it doesn't, it doesn't have it. All with remote sensing techniques, we've been able to determine that all of the uh, uh, black spots labeled on the map here, BS123, are uh, deposits, uh, pyroclastic deposits, uh, produced by fire fountain on the lunar surface, that are essentially at a surface composition dominated by these ilmenite rich black spheres. Uh, the area in the square is uh, the uh, Apollo 17 landing site area. As you can see, the, uh, some of these are quite extensive and carry, cover big areas of the lunar surface. Uh, you know, here's the reflection spectra that we use to make the determination concerning their surface comp composition. And here's what, a close-up of what one of these critters look like. This is uh, the Rim Abode power plastic deposit. Um, and it covers about uh, 10,000 square kilometers. And so there's a lot of material there for processing, for the removal of uh, uh, helium-3 and other uh, uh, solar wind uh, uh, gases. This material is quite deep, several so, uh, uh, tens of, uh, of meters in depth, um, and has a very smooth surface. This is a radar, 3.8 centimeter depolarized radar image of Irma Bode. The black material, the blackest area right toward the, uh, down from the center of the image is the Irma Bode deposit. Now, why is that important? What's, it, what's black? What's that mean? It's a very low radar return, very low. Essentially, there is zero return on the surface of that deposit. There are essentially no blocks or fragments on the surface of the rim of load, that black area uh, of 150 centimeters in diameter. So that's a, uh, it's a very smooth deposit. That could be very important if you're um, uh, processing regolith, if you're uh, in placing a, a, a lunar base, or for other, uh, other reasons. Um, there are additional factors that favor power clasting deposits as lunar base sites. They're the large area or extent of individual deposits. But all of them are relatively deep. The ease of mining, of course, absence of rocks and blocks, it's relatively uncontaminated. The loose, deep uh, would be, uh, deposits would be ideal for covering modules with adequate thicknesses of shielding material. The previous speaker mentioned uh, volatile elements are rare on the moon. Uh, what there are happen to live on the surfaces of those pyroclastic grains. That, that's one of the criteria we use for identifying uh, pyroclastic spheres in the, uh, uh, among the return uh, samples, is they have surface correlated volatiles. Uh, some sulfur, uh, zinc, bismuth, lead, cadmium, a uh, whole periodic table of uh, almost volatile elements are, are there. And of course, the abundance is low, but they, it's easy to get them on. Uh, they can be, um, just by eating them up, the volatile elements will uh, come off. They're not distributed throughout the grain, just on the surface. They could be collected as a byproduct and would be useful for lunar base development. And the last two slides just uh, illustrate uh, uh, lunar mining operations. We see the uh, uh, electrical bulldozer there struggling away with uh, the uh, giant blocks and the regolith, and that's not what you want to do. You want to have 
It's nice, smooth, pyroclastic material, uniform size, no nasty old blocks like you see in this image. It's real easy to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, mine and uh, process an excellent feedstock. And of course, most important, it might uh, save your life if you're in this position here, replacing, well, imagine this was the first module you were trying to replace, and uh, uh, you really wanted to rapidly cover that module with five meters of lunar material uh, before you radiation got you, uh, that uh, you might really like to be on the, uh, one of these pyroclastic deposits. I think of it in terms of something why. I think of it in terms of uh, uh, the black sand beach trying to, to, to excavate a net, which is fairly simple, as opposed to the jagged lava flows up on the flanks of the volcano where you could pound away all day and not uh, do any good. So that's an example of how we use remote sensing uh, techniques to uh, do um, uh, prospecting on the surface of the moon and some of our most recent results employing spectrum reflectance and radar data. And I guess that's uh, my, my time is probably up at this point. Thank you. Yes. start digging and you do your operations uh, in uh, the middle of this uh, black sand to see, uh, isn't it kind of dull uh, looking out the window or trying to do any geology other than pyroclastic deposit geology? You have to go a long way to... Uh... Well, it depends on what you mean by a long way. Well, I mean, some people uh, would find those pyroclastic deposits absolutely fascinating scientifically. <laughs> do you know anybody like that? <laughs> 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 so my colleagues who are volcanologists to specialize in pyroclastic eruptions, I, I suspect, <laughs> oh, would, would love it. No, there are good questions. Those, those pyroclastic spheres, are, uh, those are the most primitive material that we have on the moon. Uh, there's never been a piece of the lunar mantle, what's beneath the crust, never been a piece of the lunar mantle found. Those Mars basalts that uh, are the product of partial melting of the mantle, so it's a, it's a sample of it, but things have messed around with those Mars basalt magnets. Uh, the, these things, the liquids, the magmas that came up, the fire fountain, to make these power plastics, uh, they didn't mess around. They didn't uh, uh, reside at depth. After they melted, they came out and came out quick. So those things are almost, are, are the closest example to the lunar mantle we got. And a lot of people just go, you know, gaga over that uh, in the uh, sample community. Uh, no, as luck would have it, and I'm not just making this up, those uh, pyroclastic deposits just happen to be in, in absolutely fascinating areas geologically. Uh, the back slope of the Imbrium Basin, there are like sinuous rills and strange mysterious depressions and all sorts of really great stuff. In fact, that's one reason I really like Rome Boat is because there are so many interesting scientific questions uh, from a geological, from a geoscience standpoint that could be addressed at that site. I can imagine if those deposits were stuck off in the southern highlands someplace and or there would not be very much of interest around. But these, they are almost, yeah, all of them are, to one degree or another. The Aristarchus Plateau is covered with pyroclastics. Unfortunately, they, as far as I can tell, don't have ilmenite. 
Um, and I think the Aristarchus Plateau is probably, as many would agree, it is arguably the most scientifically interesting spot on the lunar near side. So, uh, anyhow, no, that would be a great place. Those pyroplastics are tremendous. I think we'll have to have him take the other questions after the session is over or right outside, though I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to anybody who was interested. Thank you again for the talk.